Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Be Well Texas Harm Reduction Echo. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating today's session. Please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Please know that anything listed in the chat does not appear in the recording. A few quick announcements before we begin. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat function. To access the chat feature, click on the speech bubble icon at the bottom of your window. If you join by phone only, please email your phone number and name to bewelltx at yutaskabai.edu. We appreciate your support in helping us fully capture this record. Some housekeeping, there are a lot of attendees in this room, uh, so please do remember to stay muted unless you're speaking and to remute yourself once you've spoken. If you've joined my computer, your mute button is in the bottom left of your Zoom controls. If you're on the phone, please press star six. We encourage you to unmute and speak, or if you could prefer, you can use the chat feature to share your comments and questions. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or in the discussion. If you would like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. Towards the end of the session, the Be Well Texas team will send out links to uh, an evaluation survey uh, please complete it. You will be entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is on syringe exchange program and will be presented by Chris Abert. Following that, we will discuss a case presented by Michaela Gibbs. Um, so we'll kick off the session with some introductions, didactics, BWEL program announcements, case presentation and discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I encourage you all to share your experiences, insights, and questions in today's conversation. And that, and with that, we'll start with some intros. Chris. Hello, everybody. Christopher Aber. I'm with Southwest Recovery Alliance. Um, we are a small but mighty harm reduction organization uh, doing certain service programs, um, advocating for the expansion of life-saving medication from naloxone, methadone, uh, buprenorphine, and uh, eventually a safe supply. Uh, but mostly what we're doing is trying to give space where people who are using drugs can build power, uh, change policies, and have a place where they can meet without judgment. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Aaron. Yeah, so I'm Aaron Ferguson. I am on the leadership team of the Urban Survivors or National Survivors Union now that we're called to include um, rural communities. And um, I am a drug user activist working to abolish the harms associated with the drug war and to organize people who use drugs to fight for the right to health and safety. Um, I'm working to found the first Texas drug user union, which is called the Texas Drug User Health Alliance. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but um, I work in outreach on methadone. So I work to help people get access to methadone in jails, prisons, uh, family courts, wherever we can um, as a safe supply of opioids to prevent overdose and um, help people to reintegrate with the community and gain stability. Um, but uh, I am hoping to plug an event that we have coming up on the third Thursday of this month. I'll be putting a link to a flyer in the chat um, we meet the third Thursday of every month. The Texas Drug User Health Alliance is an organization by and for people who use drugs. And we've been conducting a drug checking program in which we've been utilizing mail order drug checking kits over the last several months uh, to determine what's in the drug supply uh, in the interest of the health and safety of people who use drugs here. And so this is a community driven research program that we've been conducting, and we'll be reviewing the results of that on June 15th. I will put a link to the flyer in the chat here periodically and appreciate you guys sending anybody that you work with um, who would benefit from harm reduction, drug user organizing, wants to know more about what's going on in the drug supply in Texas, or just needs community. Thanks so much. Happy to be here today and looking forward to today's session. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, Ria. Hi everyone, my name is Ria Sinas. I go by she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, I live in Portland, uh, Arizona, Portland, Oregon, <laughs> by way of Arizona. Um, I am the co-founder of the Academy of Perinatal Harm Reduction. Um, we are an organization that provides equitable health information to uh, pregnant and parenting people and clinicians. Um, 
uh, um, for around substance use. Um, I'm also on the leadership team of the Narcofeminism Story Share Project with the Urban Survivors Union, which is a national drug user union. Um, I work in as a harm reduction specialist at Outside In, which is a federally qualified healthcare center that has a drug user health services inside of the program, which is pretty awesome and unique. Um, I am a mom and I am a, um, a drug war survivor and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rhea. Andrea Hebler. Hello, my name is Andrea Hebler and I am the program coordinator for CSTAT and welcome everybody. Thank you. And Michaela Gibbs. Hi all, I am a, uh, I'm currently the chief dental officer and a um, practicing um, clinician for over 27 years um, in um, access um, challenge settings. So I have worked in pub public health settings and have worked um, to connect individuals at risk to care. I have been part of, uh, in my previous role at University of Florida, I was part of a um, interdisciplinary um, uh, provider group that helped to facilitate um, the interaction of medicine, um, medical resources, um, social support systems, and um, dentistry to hopefully um, assist individuals that are at much higher risk for um, com complications or poor outcomes from, um, from chronic and acute diseases. So have worked in access settings my whole life and um, um, this is just one of the, the case that we'll be doing today is just one of probably a thousand cases similar that I've seen in my in the course of my career. So thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, with that, we will move on to our didactics. Um, Keita, if you could please bring them up. And um, Chris, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. I'm ready. Uh, yeah, this uh, didactic is going to be about syringe service programs and, and making the case for syringe exchange programs and improving community health. Uh, you know, this this there's not going to be a ton of revolutionary information in this, um, though. Unfortunately, Texas doesn't have a robust syringe service program, so it might be a lot of new information for hopefully for a lot of people uh, on this call on this session. So yeah, next slide, please. Actually, originally titled uh, SSP's Duh, uh, because it's uh, Duh as in drug user health, and SSP's as in syringe service programs, and Duh, we should be having <laughs> syringe service programs for, for to improve drug user health. It really is a no-brainer. Um, that I know sometimes people refer to them as syringe exchange programs. We're getting away from that uh, because it's not necessary to do one-for-one -one exchange by any means uh, to have an effective program. Uh, it's not, maybe we'll talk about it at, at the very end, um, about the danger of, or lack, honestly, of danger of disease transmission from improperly disposed syringes in the community. Uh, a lot of people are terrified of that, and I just want everyone on this call to know there's never been a case of HIV transmission from an accidental needle stick in a community setting. It's never happened. You have a greater likelihood of getting hit by a meteor uh, than getting HIV from a from a community uh, found accidental needle stick. So that's something to share, right? That's something that when next time someone's freaking out about uh, kids in the playground, I'm also worried about kids in the playground, but I'm not worried about the syringes. I'm worried about you know broken glass, uh, not having nice enough equipment, things like that. I think are much more dangerous than a, than a syringe. That being said, they're very scary, and I never want to disqualify that. Syringes, even in sterile environments, can be very scary for people. Um, okay, so the learning objectives are we're going to illustrate the need for, for syringe service programs. We're going to describe some of the benefits of syringe service programs. We're going to explain how they function. Uh, and we're going to identify regions, uh, identify strategies that regions can use where they don't have SSPs. So you'll see an arrow to the right, and you'll see a bunch of different supplies. Many of those are perfectly legal to distribute uh, and very easy to access. So after I do each slide, uh, that will go through points one, two, and three. There's going to be a picture to the right uh, of of a something as simple as an alcohol pad, and we're going to talk about how that can improve uh, drug user health even without the syringes. Totally should tell you right up front, though. 
the syringe itself is the carrot to get the people in the door. Uh, so I've seen many people get all the supplies besides syringes and, and then say, well, but they're not coming. Uh, so it is a very effective carrot to get people in the door uh, to then be able to supply them with all these other, other goods. But it can be done without syringes. Uh, there's also another way to do it where it's not legal, and that's the that's the roots of syringe service programs in the in the first place. It's a guy named Dave Purchase. Uh, he just set up this table in public, started giving out syringes. Law enforcement thought he must have permission to do so, because uh, why else would he be out there just giving the stuff away? And he did not, in fact, have permission. Um, it's also important to know, I'm going to go through a lot of uh, evidence that this is a wonderful, unparalleled public health strategy. Uh, it's important to remember that initially public health came out against these programs uh, and officials came out saying it would increase drug use, it would increase drug traffic, it would increase, de dis uh, it would increase syringes that were, that were uh, improperly disposed. Uh, and so they, they, we did a lot of work, harm reduction people, people doing this work uh, in acts of civil, civil disobedience, uh, paired with some researchers and, and in fact found the opposite, which is what this presentation is going to be all about, all of the wonderful public health data that we got as a result of these folks going out and doing it, even though they didn't have permission and it wasn't sanctioned. Uh, so that is one option for, for people that people have engaged in, not only for certain service programs, but for naloxone distribution, for uh, HIV medication distribution, for hepatitis C uh, distribution, for safe, safe consumption sites, for safer drug sites. Those things are still happening uh, today. So yeah, oftentimes uh, it's not sanctioned. Uh, that being said, this is a map somewhat somewhat updated, uh, the most updated I could find at least, uh, where uh, syringe service programs are not permitted or locally permitted and or legal. And I know there's some gray area in Texas. Uh, you know, we, we had gray area in, in New York, gray area in Arizona until recently. Um, so that's not to say that it's not locally permitted. It's, is it legislated? Uh, that it's locally permitted. It's one thing for someone to turn a, an, an eye to it. Uh, we want it to be legal because we don't, don't want to put, A, the people who are distributing those supplies at risk, but most importantly, we don't want to put the people who are receiving those supplies at further risk because uh, often they're so incredibly vulnerable uh, to arrest and just having their lives destroyed as a result of something as simple as uh, trying to stay safe from HIV or hepatitis C. Next slide. So a, a few things that syringe service programs most definitely and, and without uh, doubt do. Uh, they absolutely do decrease the spread of HIV. There was no greater and more effective um, strategy for reducing HIV in the height of the AIDS uh, epidemic uh, than, than syringe service programs and people giving out syringes, sterile syringes to people who are using drugs. Nothing was more effective than that. Uh, if we want to get to zero, which we do, uh, we are going to have to, to talk about the 7 to 14 percent varies across the country of new HIV infections uh, that are a result of not having access to sterile syringes. Uh, the antidote to that is give access to sterile syringes. Uh, it also reduces the risk for hepatitis C. I, I might be repeating myself here later, but when you have a... a, a well-funded and easy to access syringe service program in conjunction with access to methadone and or buprenorphine, uh, you can reduce HIV and hep C transmission 75 to 80%. Uh, it also increases the likelihood to link people who use drugs with other services. So like I said, we tend not to say syringe exchange program anymore. And um, we tend to use syringe service program. And that emphasizes that, yes, I am using a syringe or maybe uh, safe smoking materials to get people to come in. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm linking them with other life-saving services that they would not otherwise have access to. And we'll talk about that in another slide. Next slide. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, SSPs encourage drug use. And if you didn't give out syringes, then they would stop uh, injecting drugs. Uh, when I moved to Arizona, this was one of the first things I found. I said, hey, bring in your old syringes. We'll dispose of them as we give you these new sterile syringes. This was literally within the second batch of old syringes that was brought in. It is a straw uh, that has been melted with a lighter. 
Uh, who knows how many times it's been used. If we could zoom in on the tip of, or the bevel of, of the needle, we would be shocked uh, at how barbed it would be and all the uh, gouges in it that allow for the transmission of bacteria and other infections. Uh, so it doesn't encourage drug use. It doesn't encourage uh, and or enable uh, people to inject when they otherwise wouldn't. Uh, it enables people to stay safe from, uh, from equipment like this. Uh, it also, syringe, syringe programs don't increase dis, inappropriately discarded syringes. They did a study between uh, Miami and San Francisco uh, and found, again, unequivocally, uh, that beginning a syringe service program did not increase improperly disposed syringes. Uh, and also a common misconception uh, is that syringe service programs will increase needle stick injuries. Uh, and across the board, we don't see an increase in needle stick injuries because we don't see an increase in improperly disposed of syringes either. Uh, so next slide. Uh, many SSPs uh, have goals. Uh, there's one that's not important, that's not on here, that's the most important that I'll get to at the end. Uh, but some of the goals, the stated goals of syringe service programs are obviously to prevent disease transmission, uh, to protect first responders. Uh, and I mean that in the sense of if a first responder, say law enforcement comes up and asks if I have anything sharp that's gonna stick them, I'm much more likely to say, yes, I do, if I'm not fearing uh, felony arrest or, or even misdemeanor arrest or even a ticket, uh, I'm much more likely to be honest about that. And there was a study done in Connecticut that showed uh, a 66% decrease in accidental needle sticks among law enforcement due to uh, the legalization of a syringe service program. So 66% reduction. One in three police officers will be stuck, uh, usually multiple times within their careers, and we could reduce that by 66%. That's huge. If, if you go into a police department uh, with that kind and said, hey, I could reduce officer injuries with a new Kevlar vest, right? Or a new bumper for your car by 66%, uh, they would immediately embrace it. Uh, and Oftentimes, uh, given the right messenger, they will embrace this just on that fact alone, that 66% reduction in accidental needle sticks. Uh, goals of syringe service programs are also to prevent overdose deaths, obviously, uh, to educate people who are using drugs, uh, not only about uh, their, you know, how to better maintain their health, uh, but also about their human rights and how to organize uh, and start demanding that their human rights be Respected, And for me, that's the most important work that we're doing. I love the public health work we're doing, uh, but the human rights and the organizing work and uh, creating space where people can really have access to meaning and purpose <laughs> in their life and not just staying alive, but like thriving uh, to push back against systems that have often left them uh, abandoned to death and disease. Um, so we also want to navigate people to treatment when appropriate. Uh, and by when appropriate, I mean, we don't push that down uh, people's throats. Uh, and, and to connect people who are not in treatment uh, with services. I said that before. I'm going to say it a million times. There have been two studies out that I think are pretty telling. Uh, one was from Johns Hopkins, and it basically said out of all the people who qualified for an opioid use disorder, 84% uh, of them were not engaged in treatment. So they were past the point of prevention and they weren't engaged in treatment. 84% were just abandoned uh, to do the best they could under prohibition. Uh, and syringe service programs stop that madness. And we engage folks uh, and we offer them access to make positive change in their life. Uh, and then another study came out that showed that people with substance use disorder, 95% uh, of them didn't think they needed treatment, right? Didn't self-identify as being in need of treatment. Uh, so we want to reach that 95% of people as well. Next slide. Uh, as I was saying before, the, access, the lack of access to sterile syringes uh, leads to 8,000 people uh, being diagnosed with HIV every year and up to, up to and more than uh, 30,000 people uh, transmitting hepatitis C every year. So again, this is 100% preventable. It is only because of the lack of access to uh, sterile supplies. Sometimes I think we'll say, oh, it's you know, it's because of drug use. They're, using drugs doesn't <laughs> uh, 
can't get HIV just because you're a drug user. You get HIV because you didn't have access to sterile supplies. So I always like to make sure I stay. It's really about access to sterile supplies, uh, not drug use. Next, next slide. So the reduction in HIV, again, is unequivocal. Uh, the syringe service programs were the most effective evidence-based HIV prevention tools for people who use drugs, uh, both within the context of the HIV epidemic in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, and today. Um, there, there's no major uh, national health agency that doesn't conclude that the use of sterile syringes stops HIV and other bloodborne diseases. Uh, and it's important to remember, again, just like people who use drugs were out there breaking the law to distribute these supplies, uh, they were um, they were the main reason uh, that the that the course of the AIDS epidemic was changed uh, because so it wasn't public health, uh, it wasn't hospitals, it wasn't it was just folks who were engaged in mutual aid with each other and didn't want to see their friends dying. Next slide. Uh, it can also reduce hepatitis C. So almost a third of people who inject drugs reported sharing syringes and other equipment. If we can give out equipment where they don't have to share, obviously that will reduce that. Uh, we also refer people to hepatitis B vaccination, hepatitis C treatment, uh, and safe injection equipment can make sure that people who don't have hepatitis C remain hepatitis C free, right? We empower, uh, we allow people to be accountable for their health. We allow people to take responsibility for their health and stay H hepatitis C and HIV free. Next slide. Uh, as I said, 30% of, uh, we can just skip that. I already went over that. So it's good for law enforcement too. So if you have law enforcement uh, friends out there that are against this, uh, again, know that it reduces uh, accidental needle sticks, reduces paperwork, reduces fear, time off work, uh, insurance costs, all those things are reduced by access to uh, syringe service programs. Next slide. Also prevents overdose deaths. Uh, so we all know there were over 109,000 uh, unintentional drug overdose deaths uh, last year. Uh, naloxone distribution by people who use drugs in Arizona, uh, it's phenomenal, right? Millions of doses going out every year uh, among people who are using drugs. And I think it's 98% of reported overdose reversals were administered by either family and or other friends uh, that were present uh, at the overdose incident. That's amazing. If we can get it into the hands of the people who are most impacted, they will use it. Uh, we can also do overdose prevention trainings through SSPs. Many syringe service programs uh, transition to become overdose prevention centers when legally allowed to, uh, and offering even more services to prevent overdoses. And of course, we can, uh, in many states, give out testing strips, uh, xylazine testing strips and fentanyl testing strips being the most um, uh, important right now, perhaps. Um, FTIR, a mass spec drug checking, is also available at many syringe service programs across the world. Uh, so you can get a quantitative and qualitative idea like what Aaron was talking about. Uh, but rather than sending them off and waiting a week, it happens in real time. You can find out immediately what is in the drug supply, which is crucial if we're going to stop uh, uh, that aspect of this endemic. Next slide. These are some of the strategies and policies that involve syringe service programs. So if you are on board with the CDC strategies to prevent uh, opioid overdoses, well, then you are on board with syringe service programs. If you're on board with the HIV AIDS strategy uh, that was put out in 2020, you are on board with syringe service programs. If you agree with the National Hepatitis Elimination Plan, then you, uh, you inherently have to agree with the syringe service programs. Uh, SAMHSA's Opioid Overdose Toolkit also includes syringe service programs. So it's an integral part of all of these national plans uh, to solve these problems. Next slide. We're almost done too, by the way. There you go. There's 30. I know I didn't individually list all the research because there's so much of it. It's overwhelming. There's 30 years of peer-reviewed research there for everyone to peruse through. Again, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a, a landslide of of, of information. Uh, and what I really love about this is the, the so much of this was, was informed and or led by people who use drugs. Next slide. Here are some organizations who support syringe service programs. I only listed uh, health organizations, right? So National Institute of Health, CDC, Psychological Association. So this is a, this is a hefty list. Right of people who support it. When I when I I once put together a opposition list and I included other words, but I I just want to because clearly like 
you know, law enforcement tends to, there are a lot of uh, places that don't understand public health that are against this, but all of these that are involved in public health and health uh, support. And so I made up a slide of health organizations that don't support SSPs. Yeah, and that's it, it's exhaustive. There's not a site, I couldn't find a single national uh, health organization that had come out against the rent service program. So can we go back to the last slide? There's who supports it, next slide. There's who doesn't, next and next slide. Uh, obviously there's a lot more than just syringes going out and the services uh, we can, just by mere existence, people are five times more likely to seek treatment uh, if there's a syringe service program, which makes sense because we build rapport with people, we build trust with people. Uh, so there are uh, at, at any instance in our life ready to engage with any kind of treatment, any positive change, uh, we, we're going to be the people that come to. And we have created a path to the 85% of people that are being ignored by our system right now uh, so that they were already engaged in service. We can offer other services, mental, uh, dental, and, and medical, the vaccinations. Uh, I put the umbrella there. I didn't go through any of the side images. I am so sorry. I put the umbrella there to symbolize sex workers because uh, we often engage uh, a lot of street level sex workers, uh, survival sex workers, and how to stay safe. Uh, that can be everything from condoms and lube to bad date lists. Uh, we can prevent the disease transmission for non-injectors by giving out, as I said, many programs will give out smoking apparatus and move people away from injecting and to smoking. Uh, even if it's just one out of three incidents, it can reduce uh, disease transmission and overdose. And I, I like the last three, uh, accountability to others, right? We can... is. You create an avenue where people can be accountable to each other. Uh, oftentimes people are like, what about accountability and personal responsibility? These open up avenues for accountability to our peers uh, and to other folks that we have chosen to be accountable to. And it offers a, a avenue for personal responsibility to take care of our health when it's not criminalized, right? When we criminalize healthcare and make it impossible to get to, you can't then say people aren't taking responsibility for their health. Um, we also can organize, and, and again, this is what I think is the most important thing. My friend Daniel Raymond once said, you know, if you're out there giving out syringes, that's a really nice thing, right? But it's not harm reduction. It's not harm reduction until you're organizing people to push back against the systems that have that have abandoned them again to, to death and disease and, and alienation, incarceration, having our, our, our families destroyed. Uh, so we really want to organize people. Uh, and lastly, again, I'll say it again, 80% of the folks out there uh, who qualify for a uh, use disorder are not engaged in services. And we open up these SSPs and we engage them. Uh, we improve positive health. Those small positive changes add up to, to tangible and measurable positive public health uh, outcomes and, and, man, and, and qualitatively for the person's life. Uh, I can't even begin to express how much of a difference it can make to get people engaged in those services, um, just in, in terms of our spirit, uh, oftentimes, which has been beaten down as a result of stigma against people who use drugs. Next slide. And that's it. That's an introduction. Uh, I will go through real quick, uh, just to let you know, if you don't have a syringe service program, you can give out things like alcohol pads, right? So people can clean before they inject. You can give out things like uh, saline and, and sterile water. You can give out little, their little bottle caps. Uh, so people can use those bottle caps rather than share spoons if they're injecting. Uh, as a dentist, uh, Michaela will know that, that you have those little cottons right, that you often use to pack uh, after dental surgery. But you can give those out and people can use those as filters uh, so that they're not either sharing or pulling cotton out of the back of tampons or, or cigarette butts, which is often an alternative. Um, we can give out naloxone, right? So there are a million ways that we can improve drug user health through these small, teaching people how to wash their hands before injection. I've said it a million times. I always wash my hands before I ate chicken wings. I don't think I ever, until, until I learned, I don't think I ever washed my hands before injection. Uh, it just didn't occur to me. Um, so even just saying something as simple as wash your hands, use this cooker. Here's a clean tourniquet, uh, because if you're using a belt and there's blood on it, uh, the blood might be transmissible of HIV for up to 42 days uh, dried. 
uh, and might transmit to somebody else that was sharing that bell. Um, I'm sure there are a million other things. I just wanted people to know you don't have to actually have the syringes uh, to begin to improve people's health. We don't want to let perfection be, I don't know what that saying is, but we don't want to stop the fact that we can't do the full thing from stopping us from at least doing partial uh, and getting these other supplies out to people. Uh, all the all the meantime, supporting folks who are doing it in an act of civil disobedience and uh, pushing for legislative change to make it uh, safer for, again, both distributors and the recipients of these life-saving supplies. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for a wonderful presentation. We have time for maybe a couple of questions from our learning community here. So going to open up the floor for any questions or comments. Also, apologies. I tried to get an hour long presentation into 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So sorry if I went a little fast. Gary. It's more. Thank you. It's good to see you again, Aaron. We saw you at this Texas conference. Um, but for Christopher, you know, I was outreach. I went to Arizona for um, 10 months. And to see what the difference was there as opposed to what we what it is in Texas is is life changing. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. But I'll be so glad when we're there here. Thank you. I might be overly optimistic, but I think that we are on the right side of history and Texas will. Uh, they will eventually. <laughs> Uh, legalized syringe service programs. Uh, so I appreciate all the work people are doing. It is hard work. Again, uh, in, in Indiana, we had the worst HIV epidemic in the history of the world in Scott County. Uh, and that is when then Governor Mike Pence relented and allowed syringe service programs. That allowed other conservative uh, governors across the country uh, to, to also allow. Uh, so we know that it can happen under any administration. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, I really appreciate the work everyone's doing, and I do think we're on the right side of history. Uh, we'll look back eventually and think it was real folly uh, to to be euphemistic about it that we didn't uh, do this earlier. Yeah, we, we do have some folks that are taking action here. I know uh, the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance has fought really hard to get Travis County to issue a state of public health emergency um, so Austin is in a state of public health emergency for overdoses, and that's allowed funds to be spent on naloxone, at least. And the county judge, Andy Brown, is really in support of harm reduction. We had a big event really urging the county to develop an advisory council for the utilization of opioid settlement dollars. So opioid settlement dollars are coming to the Texas to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. And it is very important for everyone to get out and demand that people who are directly impacted and people who are working directly with people who use drugs are part of the conversation about how those funds will be spent because we know what will happen if we don't. Um, so I just wanna get everybody fired up about that because we really need your help. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, with that, we will move on uh, to uh, the next part of our ECHO. Uh, Kayla, if you could please share the announcements. Thank you so much. The Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring provides high quality education in best practices for responding to substance use. CSTAT can help enhance professionals' knowledge and self-efficacy to screen, treat, and make referrals for people with substance use disorders. To learn more, please visit our website at cstat.udiska.edu. Next slide. To claim your CME credit, you must text today uh, by midnight. Uh, text attend 1009-2931-2844-502-1338 uh, by midnight tonight. Next slide. Join us for our next Harm Reduction Echo. It will be on Thursday, July 6th. Next slide. There has been a new announcement. The FDA has approved Brixari buprenorphine extended release injection to treat moderate to severe OUD. Uh, please watch out for more information. We will be having uh, uh, some information coming up on our website. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our case for today. 
Um, Kato, if you could please bring the case up and uh, Michaela, you can take it away. Thank you. Yeah, so um, no, thank you very much for having me. So it was really interesting as I was thinking about um, a case um, to present today. Um, this this case was forefront in my mind, um, A, because it there's so many, so many factors that that make it so critical that we connect this individual with um, services um, in order to prevent um, harm, ultimately um, morbidity and, and unfortunately mortality, but also because it represents so many individuals that we see um, that that um, present to our um, our treatment facilities, whether it's here, whether it's in the public health system. And for those of you who might work in FQHCs, um, you also may, may see this quite often. And any vulnerable populations, um, the, obviously the, the, the challenges of not only treating these patients, but treating um, everything that goes into um, ensuring that they, they, they recover and, um, and, and thrive afterwards. Um, is an incredible challenge. And so, um, so really this is, this is uh, a very typical, sadly, a very typical story that we see um, an individual who, um, who has, you know, numerous, um, you know, challenges, um, social, social challenges um, and um, issues um, just navigating everyday life presents to our, our um, clinic um, with a significant dental infection. He's coming because he's, he has pain. He's not had um, traditional and regular dental care, which is which is unfortunately very common in more than half of the population due to to resources and access issues. So he comes because he's got pain, and um, and as he's he's going through the process of having this the 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 pain um, the pain addressed, uh, we do a soft tissue exam, and and I don't know how many of you know this, but but um, a significant number of um, oral cancer lesions are identified by dentists, um, not only um, um, in emergency visits, but certainly by just general dentists, because we're we're taught to really evaluate um, and um, and uh, look for these things um, every time somebody comes in. And so it's really important that that we as dentists are trained to do this because um, it's the sixth most oral cancer or um, head and neck cancer is the sixth most common um, cancer. Um, throughout the world. Um, it has a very high mortality rate, 50%, 50% of people that get oral cancer die. Um, and the recurrence rate is also very high. And so um, this is obviously amplified in vulnerable populations. So when you look at somebody like this individual that, that presented um, with these multiple so, um, you know, challenges, determinants of health that are, are undermining his ultimate um, recovery, um, it makes sense that that um, we would want to do everything we can for him. So um, there, there's some major issues with this. Um, he is, he is, um, he does struggle with alcohol um, um, uh, abuse. He um, also um, has a very high pack year history of tobacco use, ongoing tobacco use, um, does not have a uh, robust social support system and certainly does not really have access to or um, any kind of inclination towards regular, um, either dental or medical care. Um, and so what that does, it puts him at risk for a number of things, both in the acute um, phase of his, of his treatment and also in the, the follow-up and chronic um, ongoing recovery phase of his treatment. The first issue is, is that um, because he has, he has been diagnosed with cirrhosis and he has decreased liver function, he's at risk for um, excessive bleeding with any type of surgical procedure, which we did see when we removed the tooth. Um, um, so obviously intraoperatively, that translates to any kind of cancer resection is very risky because of his, his decreased liver function. So that's a huge issue. Um, obviously, um, any type of, of, of continued substance use um, will undermine his, his therapeutic outcomes after, during and after treatment. So uh, obviously, somebody who is who is even slightly impaired cannot um, follow a complex treatment regimen um, once they are released from from tertiary care. Um, the big issue, another big issue, when you talk about chronic um, problems, is that the two biggest risk factors for development of oral cancer are are excessive alcohol use and um, excessive tobacco usage. The usage of, of marijuana is much less closely tied to the development of oral cancer in the literature. However, it is now becoming 
obviously with, with legalization of marijuana and, and the ability to track, track this a little bit better, we are seeing obviously a, a, a correlation between ongoing um, um, marijuana use by, um, you know, by non-edible um, methods um, that also contributes to the formation of, of, of oral cancer. So what happens is, is that if you don't get these people um, obviously into treatment to treat, to treat these disorders, then uh, not disorders, but these, these issues, then you, um, then you make them much more likely to have a recurrence in the future. The recurrence rate is high. If you, if you continue to, to have the risk factors that cause the issue in the first place, the likelihood of, of um, recurrence is very high. Um, so it's imperative that we are able to connect these individuals with services um, in order to address um, both the, the alcohol use and also the, um, the nicotine um, use. The issue is, is that um, first of all, um, for many dental procedures, there's no connection between any kind of um, medical support in getting that care. Um, uh, so, so for example, if if there's any re any related dental issues that we need to take care of, they're not covered by medical insurance. So it tends to, to tap people's resources, just trying to get them to the point where they can be treated for their cancer and be stable enough to do that, um, which eliminates any possible resources for. Um, for um, intervention as far as um, uh, rehabilitation from uh, alcohol use or um, obviously tobacco cessation. So um, it just it's a very complicated um, um, web of, of treatment for us. And um, um, oftentimes we are not aware because we are out of the, the core medical um, team usually. We're not usually part of that, that, that group. Um, although it's great when it happens, um, many dentists, um, not not only in private practice, but also in um, in uh, uh, academic settings like this, really have no idea what the pathways to get their patients help um, are. And then certainly when they have significant um, um, social and um, socioeconomic issues and resources uh, that when, when they have lack of resources, it makes it even the more difficult. Um, and I, I will say this, this case um, hits me really close to home because tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of my sister's death from alcohol usage. And she um, had just been diagnosed with oral cancer. So um, this is something that's really, really prevalent. Um, and I would love some guidance. Thank you so much, Michaela, for sharing the case. Uh, um, Aaron. Yeah, thank you for sharing the case and for working with this person. Um, yeah, so I just had a few questions. Um, so how long have you been working with this this person for? Um, this person specifically. So this is really interesting. He um, not not very long. Um, but he, he presented it initially. Uh, about two weeks ago, we now are just starting to connect him with the supportive services to treat his head and neck cancer. The pathology just came back. And so we're really at, at the beginning of our road with him. Okay. Sounds good. And what are some of his stated goals? So what is, if you were to ask him what success looks like, I know in the case form there, it said um, successful treatment. What, what, it, what do you think that would look like from his perspective? So I think you know I think one of the the barriers that 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 I think I see is that um, to to try to for an individual you know obviously individuals on this call know much more than I about about um, substance usage but um, I think that link between um, and this is this is our challenge as healthcare providers um, ongoing is that link between those those risk factors and those causative agents to the to the actual diagnoses that they're living right now that connecting those two um, so that you can really figure out what would motivate that individual to be healthy. And I think at this point in time, I don't know that he really 
you know, sees that there's any, any, any link to a cause effect relationship to, to the fact that he's been, you know, abusing or using alcohol and tobacco for this long and, and this, and the state that he's in right now, there's really no link. So I'm not even sure he really realizes what the benefit of quitting either would be at this point in time. Okay. And it's getting that across to him. That is really a huge challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you got to so have I, that motivation, obviously on his side, you know, you've got having right. the resources is great, but if he's not motivated and doesn't understand the benefit for him. And so certainly, I mean, how to frame that more, more successfully um, as a provider um, would be incredibly helpful for me, not only for this case, but for, you know, oh. any number of patients that we see. Yeah, that's a really good uh, point that you make. And it's something that I think a lot of people struggle with, especially when it comes to substance use, because um, most of the information that we're exposed to when it comes to the use of alcohol and other drugs is that um, is the downsides, is the potential detriments. And so most people who are not struggling with um, a, a problem with dr alcohol and other drugs um, are, are able to see all of that pretty vividly. You know, Mark Twain had a saying, nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. And uh, that doesn't just apply to drinking. It's pretty much everything. Um, and so, but then the person who's doing it uh, rarely sees that. And, and, and the fact that they don't is, is uh, it can be, can be really tough for people from the outside to understand. But we've discovered that it's actually not um, a cognitive distortion because it's a person basically protecting what they think is their best path to happiness, if that makes any sense. So even if a person's lost everything and they're sitting on a crate on the sidewalk, okay, they're still thinking about what's going to get me one level up from where I'm at. And, 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 and that's not pathological. That's just how humans are wired. We're always thinking, how can we get just a little better than we are? And if drinking is perceived as the best way to do that, there's no amount of negative consequences that will change that because we are hardwired to pursue what we view as our path to happiness at all costs. That's part of the positive drive that humans have. So I would say we need to understand what does he perceive as his best path, right? And you can do that through open-ended questioning. We can ask what are some of the benefits of drinking for you? What are some of the things that you enjoy about drinking? A lot of people have never had anyone ask them that. Most of the people who talk to them say, can't you see all the bad things that are happening to you? Can't you see the health problems that you're struggling with? Almost no one has probably asked, what is it about drinking that you like? And how are we going to replace the behavior if we don't understand what benefits it provides to the person? How are we going to make any changes to the behavior unless we acknowledge what benefits it provides? And so that's kind of one place to start. Another place would be to do a cost benefit and try to get him to honestly list the ups and downsides of drinking, the ups and downsides of stopping, and then the ups and downsides of you know making a change or not, because there are up and downsides to all of that. If he decides to stop, he'll be in withdrawal. He may have to deal with things that for 18 years he's been drinking now. You may have to learn how to cope with things that he doesn't know how to cope with. But it can be really hard to have those conversations because it takes time and open-ended questions, right? So not questions that have a yes or no answer, fully open-ended questions. And then comes the hard part, which is to support the person's goals, whatever they are, even if they misalign with our ideas about health. And I would guarantee you almost in every case, unless a person has a death wish, their goal is going to be something related to improvement, however small. I'll stop there. I think Chris had his hand up. That's great. Thank you. That's incredible. You know, I, the, all, all the motivational interviewing training that I've had in my lifetime just came rushing back to me as you were, as you were going through that. And, and, and we do forget that because, you know, we, we, we feel so passionately that, that we want to make them better, that, that even those of us who recognize that that's the right path to go down with a patient, you know, in our, in our, our quest to be, to be helpful, we sometimes forget that. And that, thank you for that. Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to tag off what Aaron was saying about, I mean, obviously motivational interviewing is really important. And so is very frank, honest, non-judgmental uh, talks with patients about risks. So I, I love the idea of engaging the patient and talking about the benefits. Uh, and then again, being 
being honest with them about the risks without it coming off as a scared straight. And if you don't stop, this is what's going to happen. Uh, because again, if, if this person has a severe alcohol use disorder, uh, then threats of negative consequences are not going to do anything except for alienate you from being able to help that person. Um, and, and to, again, reemphasize this idea of these small changes having uh, huge health benefits. Uh, so a lot of times I get stuck in black and white thinking and I'm like, well, unless they completely quit, uh, their their outlook is, is dim indeed. Uh, and the truth of the matter is there are so many ways that a person can drink more safely. Uh, I was thinking about uh, as it was going on, you know, his future and having to uh, follow a regiment uh, of um, to get better from cancer, right? Uh, post post cancer treatment. Uh, and I was thinking about all the research around HIV and hepatitis C treatment among people who use drugs. And the research was pretty clear that 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 people who use drugs uh, are able to to take drugs regularly and and follow. Um, you know, some of the problems might be caused by chaos of not having homes uh, and things like that. I see Rio's hand is up, so I'll I'll be kind of quick. Uh, but the, but the evidence at least is out there that people can continue to engage in substance use uh, and follow uh, through on their treatment plans uh, for other um, other problems like HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, and that being said, there are so many harm reduction strategies for uh, people who are using alcohol. There's everything from reduced drinking. I'll put a, a list in the in the chat of alternatives to 12-step, alternatives to abstinence-based. Uh, but there's some reduced drinking. Uh, there's addressing some of the social uh, determinants uh, that, that often accompany, like housing and poverty. It sounds like he's housed, though. So. Um, supportive pharmacology, uh, like something as simple as thiamine. Uh, for people who have severe absence use disorder, all the way to uh, naltrexone in the in the uh, Sinclair method, which is a wonderful and very effective way for people who want to uh, stop problematic drinking. Uh, and then a, a ton of safer use strategies. I'm just going to rattle through a bunch of them. Sorry if it's too much and too quick, uh, but there are, you can alternate uh, alcoholic with non-alcoholic drinks when you start drinking, right? These are such basic ideas. We wouldn't even think about it. So just like, you know, just like I might have something with a lot of sugar one night and no sugar the next night. Well, something with a lot of alcohol, then something with no alcohol. Uh, encouraging people to eat before and during their drinking, right? So that, uh, that solves the, the nutritional problem that was addressed, that was brought up in this too. Uh, setting limits for how much I'm going to drink. Uh, consuming beverages with lower alcohol amounts. Uh, right. So a beer that doesn't have quite as much alcohol or even diluting it. Uh, my parents know a lot about diluted alcohol, <laughs> unbeknownst to them. Uh, <laughs> planning, uh, planning non-drinking days. So if there is something that he has to show up to, that's going to be really important that he not be inebriated, uh, that he plan to not drink that day and or plan to just moderate his drinking enough to be able to get out of the house. As Aaron said, people drink for a reason. Oftentimes they come to our appointments having uh, been drinking. Uh, and the only way they would have even showed up is if they were allowed to drink before they came. So rather than punish them, be like, okay, well, let's, let's get you an Uber and make sure you don't drink too much to where you can't understand directions and things like that. Uh, and again, things like basic harm reduction, like the setting that he's drinking in, don't drive, don't mix your drugs, make sure you're hydrating uh, before, during, and after you drink and, and ways to track your drinking. As I said, there's a, a bunch of uh, resources for this from uh, harm reduction for alcohol, hams, to moderation management, and I'll put those in the chat. Uh, for, so there's a million alternatives to 100% to abstinence for the rest of this guy's life uh, that could have a really fantastic uh, positive health outcomes for him. Uh, and I just don't want to make sure uh, make sure we don't miss all these opportunities. He fits into the people I was talking about, that 90% of people who don't who don't reflect that they need uh, any, any, I think it was 95% that don't think that they need to engage in treatment at all. So let's engage them in other ways. Rhea? I, um, yeah, I was just going to piggyback. Actually, I put it in the chat. Um, there's a really great resource. Um, Kenneth Anderson wrote a book, uh, How to Change Your Drinking. Um, and he, there's an online support group called HAM. Um, and he does a lot of what was already been discussed, like um, cost, uh, cost uh, deci decisional balance worksheets, cost benefit analysis, um, and just kind of, you know, does a lot of, um, the book's really great. Um, it's, it's really in-depth. And Kenneth himself was uh, a person who 
um, and is a person who um, actually utilizes the program that he created. So um, it's coming from a place of lived experience. Um, and I think it's really interesting that, um, you know, dentistry as an intervention, uh, I mean, it makes sense. It's not something that never occurred to me before, but I, um, one of the things that uh, came to mind is it seems like um, this is something that you're consistently coming up, up against or experiencing. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, and you probably have already thought of this, but um, I'm wondering if it might be useful to potentially maybe partner um, with uh, maybe like some of the public health clinics in your area, like to maybe, you know, outreach this population or to be able to create um you know, a, a pathway for people to engage with harm reduction services, if there are any in your area, because um, it, it it could be a really, really powerful way to get us to, to outreach a population of people that would otherwise not be engaging with any kind of um, with any kind of services that aren't completely abstinent, abstinent based. Um, I think there's a real dearth of those types of services available to people. And so, um, you know, patient-centered care, it's a very sexy term that's thrown around a lot, but it's not really utilized very often. And so I think it might be really cool if you could um, partner with organizations that are doing harm reduction work or that are um, already working with marginalized populations around these types of issues um, to inform your practice. And I don't know, it's just something that came up. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ria, and thank you, everybody. This has been a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, Aaron, if you could, uh, oh, you have your hand up. Uh, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add briefly that there is nothing that will reduce frustration and make you feel more rewarded in your practice than, than allowing a patient to set the goal and pursuing that with them. There is a certain level of tension that comes from having a different goal than the patient has and being continually disappointed when they fail to accomplish that. And I know that as a counselor. And when I changed my approach to just asking the person what their goal is and going all in to help them achieve it, it is so much more rewarding and so much more purposeful, and it really helps us to see results. So I just wanted to add that to everything that, that other folks have said. As far as veteran services, for somebody who doesn't qualify for VA, I'm a veteran that doesn't qualify for VA. I have another honorable discharge from using drugs. So I've had access services. University of Healthcare in Bayer County is a great organization. They have a program for people who fall below the poverty threshold, don't have health insurance. So there are other options. I shared a link for that in the chat there. Um, I want to make sure that this guy's plugged into healthcare services in general. You know, this is a person who served our country and deserves our utmost respect and deserves the right to health care as well. So uh, feel free to reach out to me separately if, you know, I can help to get connected with other services. Thank you so much, Aaron, and everyone. Thank you, um, Aaron. And I believe we kind of touched upon uh, most of the summary. Um, with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's session. Uh, this was a wonderful discussion. Uh, please do remember uh, to text the code 1009-2931 uh, by midnight today to claim your CMEs. Uh, our next session is on Thursday, July 6th. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>